Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, as you can see on the slide there, how to prepare for court. It is being recorded and so will be available after the event. Um, those of you who have registered and here today, you'll be able to find it in a number of other resources on IDR Law's free online resource, the IDRN. We're also getting an email sent out after the event later on this afternoon, so all the details will be there, so don't worry, you'll have everything you need. Um, we are presenting today's webinar, as you can see from the slide, in association with the Institute of Legacy Management. We're therefore focusing our discussion on the charity sector. However, if you're not within the charity sector, fear not, there are still CPD opportunities, so don't run away. Um, much of what we were discussing relates to anyone caught up in estate disputes, so I'm sure there'll be something of use for everyone. So who are we? Self-introductions are always awful. So very briefly, I'm a partner with IDR Law, specialist inheritance dispute firm, and I've practiced in this area of law for well over a decade. Blushingly, I've been described as an extremely knowledgeable and capable uh, lawyer by Chambers High Net Worth and as having a combination of being a very able and likable lawyer. Hopefully, I don't all let you down today with those uh, characteristics. Uh, I have the pleasure of being joined by Kate Selway KC of Radcliffe Chambers. Kate is well placed to join me today with this discussion, having been involved in a number of reported cases in relation to probate and inheritance disputes. Over the years, Kate has been described in Chambers UK and Chambers High Net Worth as being wonderful with clients and able to provide positive, robust opinions in a well thought out and careful manner. Kate's also been described as having a high level, in-depth knowledge, which she presents in a straightforward and comprehensible manner. No doubt Kate's going to bring those skills with us today when covering some of our topics. So what to expect? We will be covering the points set out in the slide uh, with a few discussion points throughout. Unfortunately, we don't have a chat function today. So we're going to ask that any of you email any questions you may have throughout the, the sort of event or at the end, and we'll collate them all and come back to the group with our answers as soon as we can after the event. We anticipate it's going to take about 40 minutes with time for well, so we'll see with theory with time for questions at the end, but you know, we're not going to be able to do those. So everyone should be away well within the hour. Uh, it is online, so I've got no fire alarms, no emergency exit warnings, no other vital bits of information to pass on. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kate, who's going to be talking to us about the types of inheritance you might receive and the types of claims you might be involved in. Great. Um, thank you very much, Cara, for the glowing introduction. Um, we'll, we'll try and keep it A, comprehensible and, and B, interesting. Um, I'll, I'll cover the first couple of sections and then I'm going to hand back to Cara. And in the latter part of uh, our talk, our presentation, um, we'll join forces and have more of a, a this way and that way chat, particularly on the subject of um, mediation, which I think uh, hopefully you will get value from the perspective of both a barrister and uh, a solicitor as we bring to bear our different experiences on the uh, on the world of alternative dispute resolution. Um, but first, um, as the first slide suggests, I think it's important to have some general scene setting. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, because aiming this at a charity audience, I think you as a charity legacy officer need to um, understand and realize what sort of beneficiary you are in the great scheme of this potential dispute that might be brewing. You could, for example, have um, a small pecuniary legacy. Alternatively, you could have the entire residue absolutely entitled. Alternative, alternatively, as is often the case in my practice where I get involved in will trust disputes and the taxation of trusts, you might be a remainder beneficiary. So you might be further down the line and you might come into your legacy after the end of a life interest. So I think that has got to inform you as to what that be, we'll, we'll begin to get the ball rolling as to what sort of role you might potentially play in a charity dispute. It will, um, in a probate dispute, it will dictate your level of involvement it will influence the level of decision making that's required from you as a charity. And it will probably it's probably also likely to dictate the stage at which you feel you need to get some legal advice. 
So I'll make a couple of obvious points, one of which is that a charity isn't going to be a beneficiary in an intestate estate. So there'll always be a will involved where a charity is Im involved as a, as, a, as a beneficiary. Another key point to note at the outset is who is the executor? Is it a neutral professional or is it a family member who's going to be caught up in the particular dispute? That also can have a heavy influence on how the litigation progresses or doesn't progress and what sort of working relationship you as a charitable beneficiary might be able to strike up with either a neutral professional or as I said um, uh, a heavily involved family member. Another key point to consider is whether the dispute that you're going to become involved in arises before or after the grant of probate. Sometimes the executor might have got a grant and it's then that the dispute arises or it might be obvious from the very outset. And for example, somebody might place a caveat uh, on the um, issue of a grant of probate such that that's not even going to be uh, possible for a time. So you can begin to see, I'm sure, um, there's a multiplicity of um, problems that might arise the landscape can be very, very varied. And it might be that what appears obvious from the beginning becomes less obvious as the dispute wears on. You know, one dispute uh, tends not to be particularly like, a, like another. Um, what sort of people are you going to be involved in? Maybe it's a family dispute where there are rival beneficiaries and difficult dynamics because, for example, you've got sibling rivalry or you've got a farming family who's caught up in a dispute or it's a family business. Alternatively, um, everybody might be uh, very on board with one another, but the language of the will is a complete nightmare. Um, so the people aren't a nightmare, but the will drafting is. So I think my, my advice at the very start is know your landscape. Um, if the landscape is very uncertain or seems very difficult, as Cara will go on to discuss in one of the, uh, the, the later topics, um, at what stage do you get counsel involved? At what stage do you get your solicitor involved? Um, another vital introductory remark that complicates things immeasurably is where one of the beneficiaries is a minor, uh, a protected party, for whatever reason, maybe they've um, maybe they're a, a, a child, maybe they lack capacity, maybe there's a court of protection, um, protected person involved. So in those sorts of cases, um, if you're lucky, a litigation friend will already have been appointed. If not, that will add a layer of complexity. And of course, the involvement of minors and protected parties. Uh, really complicates the landscape as far as settlement of claims is concerned because you're going to need invariably the court's approval. So that's a, 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 a rather a, a, a quick skate across that varied landscape. So what I'll do now is just outline, and it will be no more than an outline, each of these topics is fascinating in its own right. And if Cara starts glaring at me, um, I'll, I'll know that I've um, strayed too long in one particular topic. As a litigator, I've, I've dealt with all sorts of topics, all these and more. Um, and so I'll just whiz through to help you what sort of, again, to navigate the initial landscape. So we'll start off with will construction. Um, maybe the framing of the charitable legacy is in doubt. Maybe they've left it to the XYZ Heart Hospital and that hospital doesn't exist anymore. How is the charitable legacy going to vest you need the attorney general involved to help you um, represent the interests of charities generally or is it obvious that the xyz heart hospital simply has a new name and the litigation um, is not going to go very far because the construction point is actually quite simple that's one type of will construction point of course the difficulty might not involve the charitable legacy at all it might be another sort of will construction point entirely did the testator use clear language? Um, did the testator use language that was peculiar to the testator? Does it have an objective and obvious meaning? Um, so um, where, for example, um, 
the residuary clause hasn't been drafted particularly well and the charity charity is a residual beneficiary that will obviously potentially impact the size of the charity legacy so i think leaving the issue of will construction i'll leave you with three things to remember bear in mind three statutory provisions in particular first of all there's the possibility where the wording is unclear or it's not obvious what the testator meant that you can use extrinsic evidence to assist in the construction of a will if you need to do that it'll be section 21 of the administration of justice act haven't got time to tell you about that section in detail but if you've got ambiguity of language in your will you're sure to need that statutory um, provision. If the problem of language is a little simpler than that, and it's simply the case of curing a relatively minor mistake, you will need to look at Section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act, which tells you the occasions on which you're able to rectify a will. The other thing you can do is Two other things. I said there were three points. There, there was always more than three, so I'm, I'm just going to add another one quickly. You might need um, to make a claim, a Part 8 claim, under Part 64, simply a claim to the court for declaratory relief, in which case you'll obviously be um, a party to litigation. Or an often overlooked provision, Section 48 of the Administration of Justice Act 1985, that enables the High Court to authorise action to be taken in reliance on counsel's opinion. Um, counsel has to be of a certain seniority over 10 years call. But if the PRs or the trustees make an application having obtained the opinion of counsel and it's not too contentious, then the court can authorise those steps to be taken. So if it's that can be a construction problem, it can be a rectification type issue, um, that's often overlooked. And it might be that that is what you need to start thinking about before you have the pains and traumas of worrying about litigation. So that's um, will construction point. You'll all have heard, no doubt, of course, the typical type of probate dispute, the challenge to the will itself, not merely the language in it, but an attack on the whole will. Um, that can be because you say, or one of the other parties says, the testator lacked capacity, whole um, massive area of, of, of case law. Um, what type of capacity has been lost? Is it permanent? Is it fluctuating capacity? Um, did the testator have dementia? Sometimes it's younger testators with different sorts of medical problems. And as you will no doubt also be aware, those sorts of claims are often pleaded along with what's called want of knowledge and approval, where you want to argue that the testator, for whatever reason, didn't know and approve the contents of their will. Maybe they signed the wrong will. Um, maybe someone's trying to trick them. Um, you then get into the territory often pleaded uh, as well, of undue influence, almost amounting to coercion in the probate context. And even a couple of cases I've done in recent years, um, it's rather an old fashioned word, fraudulent calumny. It's a species of unconscionable conduct. It's not quite the same as, but it's, it's like undue influence. Sometimes it's called been a species of undue influence, but that's in a, in a way where the testator has been tricked into cutting out somebody from their will because another person has bad-mouthed that person to the extent that the testator believes character A is just an awful person and shouldn't be left a legacy under their will. Finally, there's forgery and fraud. Um, and often, as I said, you get all these causes of action lumped together. Um, a good place to have a look at uh, undue influence in the probate context, there's a fantastic summary by, as he then was, Mr. Justice Lewison, in the case of Edwards and Edwards, um, often a first port of call um, in a skeleton argument when you're relying on these sorts of things or you're having to answer um, cases like that. So um, forgery and fraud as well. Um, 
you probably know this already, but for example, a blind testator doesn't have to sign their own will. Um, somebody else can sign it for them. So there are obviously circumstances where uh, it's uh, the fraudster or the forger has greater opportunity for skullduggery. So again, um, look out for the landscape that you're in and the sort of um, uh, causes of action that are going to be pleaded. And uh, again, I won't step on Cara's toes here about um, how you start the process. Whizzing through just a couple of the other um, types of claim as well. Your executor might be useless and you want to get rid of them because they're not doing anything or they're a bad one and you need to um, get rid of them because they're acting wrongly and against the interests of the beneficiaries. That's an application under Section 50 uh, of the Administration of Justice Act. One key point about claims like that, don't use that route when it's not in fact necessary. If you're coming near to the end of an administration, even if they've stopped doing something, you'll often find that a court won't remove the executor. It will simply make directions and you might have been better off um, making a part 64 application for directions with your removal application as a backup. Whizzing through to Inheritance Act claims, obviously a charity is never going to be a claimant in this type of case, but this is a type of case that we refer to in shorthand as the 1975 Act, the Inheritance Provision for Family Independence Act, where a certain category of claimant, a spouse, a child, a dependent, can claim against an estate where it's perceived, they perceive that they haven't been made reasonable provision for. Obviously, charities are often involved in those sorts of cases because they'll be a residuary legatee. And sometimes these cases can be resolved by consent. They, they often are. 75 cases often resolve at mediation. But again, be aware that you could be, that's the landscape you could be involved in. Other types of claim against the estate, I will just mention these briefly. You might not even know the size of your estate to start with because there might be claims, for example, on an estoppel basis. The farming family, the son or daughter has worked on the farm throughout their life and then find that they haven't been left the farm in the will. They might claim the estate by virtue of an estoppel and say that it falls outside the estate. So again, that's going to have a profound impact on the amount of a charity legacy where the charity is a residuary beneficiary. Um, there might be a claim from a creditor um, who claims that they're owed a debt from the estate. There are also, of course, um, hideously complicated estates where there's a potential risk of insolvency. I've had cases where tax liabilities have been enormous and the Inland Revenue HMRC want to step in and say, that's not in the estate, that's ours. Um, estates where no one will take out a grant, um, sometimes, again, because of a large tax liability and the possibility of insolvency. Sometimes it could be as simple as an executor not being able to take out a grant uh, through ill health or, or death even. And you might, in those cases, a charity might be thinking, we need to get the ball rolling here. What do we do? As a beneficiary, can we get a grant ourselves? Answer yes. Um, you can apply under Section 116 of the C Senior Courts Act for a discretionary grant, a power to pass over others um, where nothing is happening, but you have a duty to your uh, charitable objects to realise a legacy that you've been left. And finally, um, lost will claims. Where is the original of the will? Oh dear, no one can find it. Um, can you get a copy administered, uh, admitted to probate? You're the charity, you've been left the entire residue, but the will has been lost. Can you find a copy? Has the copy been lost? What evidence do you need to establish that the testator even made a will leaving the legacy to you? So a whistle stop tour through um, a, a, a very tricky landscape, it can be. Um, I'll now pass back to Cara, who's going to tell you all about cost consequences and ethical issues. Yes, costs, that exciting topic that everyone loves to hear about. Um, Costs are an important consideration in any claim. Uh, of course they are, but particularly for charities. As a charity, you're going to have a duty not to waste funds. 
Litigation is expensive. Uh, individual party fees can be easily in excess of £100,000. Uh, it's not unusual for it to be that sort of amount of money for fully contested trials. So it's a lot of money at stake. There's also quite a few misconceptions about costs. The usual rule is not that the estate will pay. It's that the losing party will pay. Therefore, you need to be confident that your involvement in this litigation is going to be beneficial for the charity. It could be costly if not. It's also important to keep in mind that as a winning party, assuming you were to be the winning party, you're only going to recover usually around 60 to 70 percent of your costs from the losing party. Uh, and that's, of course, assuming that the losing party has any funds themselves to actually pay that adverse cost order. So recoverability of costs from a potential opponent is something really important to keep in mind when deciding whether or not you're going to be involved in this litigation. Now, as Kate covered earlier, there are some situations where you're going to have no choice. If the will's not clearly written or if you happen to be the executor as well facing a claim being brought against the estate, then you are going to get pulled into that litigation. But even in those circumstances, consideration still needs to be given as to whether or not you're going to take a neutral stance or whether you're going to become actively involved in that litigation, because it will have an impact on those costs that you may be able to recover from the estate or the other party in due course. Now, the timing of specialist advice is, I would say, vital. Now, we know that a number of legacy officers are qualified solicitors. You're going to have enormous amounts of experience with this type of work. But despite that, there's going to likely be a time, and particularly for those charities who don't have in-house solicitors or lawyers on retainer, where outside specialist advice is going to be needed. That advice can help the trustees later justify their actions with legal advice backing up any decisions that they've made with details on prospects or the options available. At any point anyone says, now trustee, why did you do that? You can turn around and say, I got advice as recommended and this was what they said to do. Now, as a bit of a, a side note, so apologies, as a firm, we've created a charity claim checker, which is due to launch shortly. And I know a number of you joining us today are already aware of this because you came and spoke to us at the ILM conference earlier this year. There's also been a number of you that helped us with online testing. So just a quick side note to say thank you to everyone who took the time to speak with us and help bring that project along. Now, for those of you who don't know what it is, the claim checker is a free online tool which will provide you with an instant answer and guidance on whether the claim being brought against your charity has merit. Now, more detail can be found on the IDRN. Um, and for anyone interested or not aware of the IDRN, please do drop me a line and I'll happily give you more information. Now, aside from costs, which I've briefly discussed, and merit, which are going to affect everyone in litigation, as a charity, you're going to have additional considerations that you need to think about you're going to need to check whether the claim or dispute is in line with your own charitable purpose. Think about the mission and aims of your charity, and if you don't know what they are, make sure you look them up. The risk isn't only potential for bad PR, but also issues within your charity if it is found that the trustees have not properly acted by becoming engaged in this particular litigation, which might be against your aims and objectives. Essentially, therefore, is the litigation, the takeaway point is, is the litigation against your charity's incorporated mission and aims? And if it is, consider what you can do to avoid that litigation. Now, it, it is quite dated because it was published in August 2016, but the Charity Commission's guidance on charities and litigations, a guide for trustees, um, and the associated charity trustee checklist uh, that are both available on the government.uk website, provide really good grounding, at least as a starting point, uh, when making decisions about litigation. Now, they clearly set out that a charity must, of course, act in the charity's best interest, and that it must manage charity's resources responsibly, and that it must act with reasonable skill and care and take appropriate advice when you need to. Uh, now, as we'll discuss in a moment, the timing of advice can be key, but I would recommend taking initial legal advice at an early stage to understand the claim you're facing and the options available to you. Uh, it may then be a case that we say, you know, 
gather further information, this is what you ought to think about before formal advice can be given or a barrister's opinion is recommended. But those are things that your friendly specialist, contentious probate lawyer can go through with you. So now I'm going to run through very briefly an overview and uh, hopefully Kate will glare at me if I spend too long on this, on what you can expect from the process itself. Now you can see briefly from the slide, I've, I've split it out into two sections. We've got pre-action and court proceedings. Helpfully, pre-action is everything before court proceedings and court proceedings is everything afterwards. Nice straightforward language, that's what we like. Um, as Kate touched upon earlier, you may be the party bringing the claim or defending it. And so there will be slightly differing steps for each to take. But in general, the pre-action stage um, runs at sort of as we set out there. The first thing to do, consider your goals and objectives as part of this litigation, be it you're the person bringing the claim or defending. This is thinking about the cost consequences, thinking about what options might be available to you, thinking about your ethical considerations that we've just discussed, but also what's the outcome. I know a number of charities heavily rely on their legacies to make project decisions. Can we do that project? Well, if we can, we need the money to land by this date. Is being involved in long term litigation, which I'll sort of briefly run through, can last from 12 months to two years and upwards, depending on the type of litigation you're involved in, is becoming involved in that going to be in the best interests? And also, what are our goals and objectives? Will it prevent us from getting that money in sooner? The next thing to, uh, as I've just mentioned, to think about is the timing. Uh, how long are you going to let this run? Now, the pre-action stage in theory could run forever. Nobody needs to settle or needs to get to a finite point if they don't try. It can just go back and forth and could become a trial by correspondence. Absolutely do not recommend that at all. So you need somebody to take control of the situation, either you do it or for you, to stop cost spiraling, because that's where a lot of costs are hemorrhaged in that early stage. Now, the next part or the most important part will be the letter of claim, the LOC or the LOR, which is the letter of response. Now, that is where both parties role is to set out their claim or their response to that claim, along with all of their evidence they have in support of their position. And the purpose of doing that is so that each party knows what they're going to face and knows what they're going to deal with and can then make those informed decisions as to whether or not they want to try and settle at an early stage or whether they think someone's chancing their arm, for want of a better phrase. Once those initial bits of uh, correspondence have been exchanged, as I put on the slide, the aim is really to narrow the issues. You might start miles apart on the opinions of different factual bits of evidence, but as each party might have uh, different parts of evidence available to them and those are exchanged, the hope is that the parties get brought closer together. That then leads you to an opportunity to consider whether alternative dispute resolution or ADR, mediation, um, oral discussions or um, roundtable meetings or written agreement, uh, written offers, sorry, uh, whether all of those things are actually available at this point in time. Now, from my perspective of running these claims, I would look at it in, do you have enough information about the claim? Do you know the value of the estate? That's something obviously Kate touched upon earlier, some claims mean that you might not know the value of the estate till the end. Have you considered your position? Position? Do you know your goals and your objectives and where you want to sit? If you know all of those things, then I would say considering ADR or particularly mediation uh, are going to be good at this stage because it's a cost effective way to resolve a dispute. Now, Kate's going to cover mediation off in more detail shortly. We're going to discuss it. So I'm not going to go into detail about that, particularly now. Um, but it's just something to bear in mind. It is possible to do it. You do not have to wait till court proceedings have been started before you think about trying to settle the claim. And actually, if you've got enough information, trying to settle it beforehand is much better. So then what about counsel's opinion? Well, by this point in time, you should have enough information to make a decision and get that advice. So now, in my view, would be a good time to get that advice before the court becomes involved, because once the court becomes involved, you are caught by strict court deadlines and you're also caught by those cost consequences, which can really start to bite once court proceedings um, kick in. 
Now, if the matter can't be resolved in that pre-action stage and you've gotten to a barrister and they've given you good prospects of a, uh, on your claim, if it's your claim or you're defending and they've either said, yes, this is worth defending or you have no choice because it's the type of litigation that you have no choice but to be involved in, then you will find yourself in that latter part, that court process. Now, part seven and part eight claims are stipulated by legislation and or the CPR, depending on the type of claim you're involved in. Part eight is evidence heavy at the start. They're known as front loaded claims. And this is because all evidence to be relied on has to be put in with the claim form and then for the respondent for their reply. So preparation really is important in this type of claim. And this type of claim includes 1975 Act claims, that like Inheritance, the Family Provision and uh, Dependence Act. If, um, uh, and you also only have a very limited amount of time as a point to raise. So if you want someone's issued that claim and sent it to you, you only have three weeks to get your response in. That's not very much time to get witness statements done, to get all your evidence together and get everything filed. So you really do need to be ready. Uh, so the suggestion is to use that pre-action stage to get your ducks in a row. Conversely, part seven claims, they require a formal particulars of claim uh, to be set out and a defence as the response and so on and so forth. The parties then run through a court process, which involves um, later disclosure of documents and later exchange of witness evidence. You've got a bit more time to gather those uh, bits of evidence together, but that's not to see you can sort of say you can sort of sit back and relax. Uh, essentially, the format and timings of evidential burdens are slightly different for both types of claims but both of them require a party to set out their claim, to set out the evidence in support of that claim or defence, and to set out any expert evidence. Now, expert evidence can include medical professionals, such as capacity reports, handwriting experts, if there's concern that the signature isn't really the testators, for example, or if it's a handwritten will that's got amendments added in. Uh, there's also surveyors, if there's property or land to be valued, and then actuaries, if there's businesses uh, and others, um, that might be needed depending on the facts of the case. Getting the right expert though is really is key. Um, you're unlikely to be the first person who instructs the wrong type of medical expert or handwriting expert, but you've got to try and avoid, avoid doing that. And knowledge in that respect is power. So make sure you're doing your research on the qualifications of the person you're instructing, because whether you instruct the right one or the wrong one, they're all going to be costing money and if you instruct the wrong one you've then got to spend out again to instruct the right one so make sure you're uh, looking at the experience that person has and the qualifications they have and make sure that those things match the needs of your case and watch out because there tends to be a rush for the well-known experts and those are usually the ones who've been involved in high profile cases previously uh, and so have good uh, experience of giving evidence in court uh, I know Kate and I come across a number of them where it is a, a dash for the get the instructions in quick. Hope you don't lose them because otherwise you're left with sort of trying to find who's second best and third best, depending on how many parties there are to the case. Um, which actually seems as Kate, I've sort of dragged you in at this point. Do you have any insight to our sort of listeners and our people joining us today of what they should be aware of when choosing their experts or those people giving evidence? because you're the one there in court cross-examining these people or uh, taking evidence from them. And, and my view is you want to get the right ones. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Um, I, I think as a, a, a sort of caveat to that, though, I think um, some parties fall into the trap of thinking, oh, we haven't got our first choice. Oh, that's a disaster. I mean, the fact is there are an awful lot of really, really good experts out there. Um, and often... Um, two experts will be the same experts in case after case after case, just because um, just because that's who the parties have um, managed to land, as it were. So, look, you know, it's not a it, 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 it is a bit of a beauty parade sometimes with these um, you know, these experts on capacity or, or the handwriting expert evidence, um, typically in probate type disputes. Um, but I think um, talking to getting advice from your solicitor um at an early stage I, I think is the key thing to do even if the litigation seems a long way off i think give it some early thought um and i think you'll then come to the realization with your solicitor's help that actually there are a number of really good experts out there and and there are various um expert witness websites you can go to and do your research that's what i'd say yeah there. 
Absolutely. And the court also tends to have a list of certain experts they accept as well. So there's there's many resources out there, but you're absolutely right. Um, and I didn't mention it, but you, but you again are right. Expert evidence is part of that when you're considering your goals and objectives. What is the claim in hand? What is it you're going to need to support your position? It quite possibly could be expert evidence. And, and that's at that stage, you want to be getting it pre-action as well. Um, the only other point I wanted to cover off in the court proceedings uh, spe specific points where I go into just quickly the running out on the timetable is cost budgeting. Um, it came in a few years back. It wasn't the most popular thing to come in from a solicitor's point of view because it added quite a lot of uh, time uh, expense and pressure. Essentially, the cost budget's role is to set out what you think your costs might be at the end if everything that you think will happen happens. Um, there are exceptions you can put in to the budget, but essentially you're saying if this runs all the way to a final trial, each of these sections, this is how much I think we're going to spend. And the purpose of it was to make sure that everyone involved in that litigation could be aware of everyone else's costs so that if they were to lose, they know what they're going to face as that potential adverse uh, cost order against them. Uh, and equally, if they're going to win, what recoverability they might get. There are some tactical considerations that some parties put into cost budgets. Um, that's going to have to be a discussion for another day because it's a whole seminar on its own. Um, but the important thing to remember and the takeaway from this is that there are really strict deadlines with filing your cost budgets and really strict implications if you miss it. Uh, which are if you miss it, you're restricted to recovering only your court fees if you're the winner. No other fees. It doesn't matter what you've put in that cost budget. If you're half a day late filing it, you are automatically sanctioned out from getting anything other than just your court fees. You can apply to the court for relief from sanctions, but it doesn't mean they're going to, the court's going to let you have that. So it's better to get it in on time or early if at all possible. And the other point is if you do get it in on time, you need to keep the cost budget updated and apply to the court early and in advance if you think you might need to increase your budget. You can't just put a budget in and go, shoo, I've done it, my budget's in, we're fine. If you overspend, you're not getting any of that back at the end if you haven't got the court's approval to amend it. Now, very briefly in terms of the court timetable known as directions, once you've uh, become part of a party to court proceedings, there's a relatively strict timeline that will exist in both part eight and part seven claims. It takes around about on average nine months to 12 months to get from start to finish of the court proceeding process. And that's assuming there aren't any pauses such as a stay in proceeding, a pause for the parties to engage in further attempts to settle the matter. The process is standardized. Uh, most courts either have very standard directions that they want you to use or the Chancery Court has Chancery directions that have to be used. They can be um, amended slightly, they can all be found online, um, but it's it's more the timing that you're amending, not the actual content. The court will reimpose it if you try and take something out. Uh, heavy focus tends to be on trying to settle and not engaging the court unnecessarily, but obviously in certain circumstances that's not possible. And so you then do run through this court process and it tends to run particular as a claim or evidence in exchange in part, uh, part eight at the beginning. And then you run through disclosure of documents which are exchanged between the parties. And it's if you've got a document that adversely affects your claim, unfortunately, you can't hide it. In the English courts, everything is shared so that both parties are fully informed as to the good and bad of each other's case. Uh, and then there's the further opportunity for witness evidence. That's um, lay witness evidence. So maybe it could be a, a family member if you're in a dispute with a family member, or it could be uh, the witnesses to the wills if there's a problem with the execution of the will or potential question over it. Uh, and then you could have maybe a solicitor if there was a, or a will writer, if they were involved in the process, giving that evidence as well. That is um, separate to the expert evidence, which is a, a completely neutral third party who is the expert in their field of what we're asking them about. So medical expert, a handwriting expert, um, property expert, all those sorts of things. So completely neutral is the expert, whereas the others come in under that witness statement section. So that's witness statements done. Then you've got your expert evidence is done. Um, and then you're left running into trial. But we're going to come to that afterwards, because at this point, everyone should have exchanged everything they possibly need to get to a point of uh, 
mediation, which Kate's now going to run through and we're just going to briefly discuss together. Excellent. Thank you, Cara. Yeah, um, there is no absolutely defined time where you should mediate. The process that Cara's just explained and we've got to the end to is a, is a good time because the parties will have exchanged witness statements and everybody will have a better idea of where their strengths and weaknesses are. You can do it a lot earlier. It really depends on the type of dispute. A will construction dispute, for example, um, you, you might be able to do it earlier. Something that's very fact sensitive is likely to be better off de dealt with later. Also, um, I think it takes parties a time to realize that they actually should mediate and that they need to mediate. And it's often, if you have a mediation too early, the lines haven't been drawn necessarily where they end up. And so you get one party being a lot more bullish than the other saying, I want my day in court. By the time you've come to cost budgeting and the full horror um, has sunk in of how much this is going to cost, um, it, it does wake parties up um, to being a lot more realistic. And I'm talking particularly here about the the sibling rivalry disputes, the family disputes, where parties have really become very entrenched on their views about what mum or dad did or didn't want to do and how mum or dad wouldn't possibly have left a will like that. Um, and there's an awful lot of emotional baggage to, to get through in the litigation process for some litigants before they realise that the mediation process um, is something that's going to help them end it. And of course, the mediation process now plays an absolutely vital role in the litigation process. You'd be um, uh, a, a, a brave and possibly foolhardy party indeed if you refuse to engage in mediation because that, and case law has shown it to be the case, can have very adverse cost consequences for you, even if you are successful in the litigation. So it does need to be treated very, very seriously. Um, there is no bad time to do mediation, but undoubtedly some times are better than others, as I've just explained. Um, and it needs to fit in with other types of ADR. So you'll need to, and you'll need advice about this invariably, um, and to get on board with your legal team about the precise timing, for example, of without prejudice offers or part 36 offers. Again, there's no rule book that says exactly when you need to have a mediation or make a part 36 offer. Do you make it before the mediation, a long time before or just before? All these strategic concerns are something that should be talked about and brought up with your legal team, because it's only through talking about these things that you can come to an agreed process and certain things make better sense than others. I mean, I've had um, lots of toing and froing with solicitors who instruct me and we're constantly thinking, right, is, it, is now a good time? Shall we leave it a bit longer? Um, when are the parties ready to treat an offer seriously? When can we bring most pressure to bear on, on settlement? Um, so that's that side of things. As I said, a court places a heavy expectation on parties um, to engage in ADR, alternative dispute resolution. That is increasingly uh, likely to involve a judge saying, do you want to try some FDR, some financial dispute resolution that is judge-led? So I've done some of those now, which, um, you know, five, five years ago, certainly, um, except in the family division, you know, we wouldn't think of particularly in the chancery division. Right. I want to sort of open up the conversation now with with Cara, because we've each got different experiences. Um, how do you identify the right mediator, Cara? What do you look for? Because it's usually solicitors that deal with this before counsel. Yeah, we do. We, we do normally get involved at that early stage. We're the ones running it. We're the ones there going, gosh, what we're going to do on this case. From my point of view, and my experience, and I've used a lot of different types of mediators with lots of different backgrounds. My personal view is that actually a mediator that knows the area of law you're talking about can be hugely beneficial because they'll understand the nuances that each party might be frustratingly bringing to the table. Uh, it's not always just we've got this pot of money. How, how are we going to sort of divide it up? There are a lot of bits going into it saying, well, this is the reason why we're not giving you more than you're sort of more than we're offering and what you're asking. And so from my point of view, it's absolutely having uh, a mediator that knows what they're doing. Personal preference for me as a mediator tends to be a barrister as well. 
um, because they have the in recent update in court knowledge. They know what the judges are doing. They're there every day. Uh, they've got an awful lot of experience of this and it's this type of role that they do. So they're really very good in my view at dealing with it. So uh, that's what I tend to go with, but that's not to say there aren't some other wonderful mediators out there that don't know this area of law um, and don't have the experience. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. And uh, I, I, I mean, I don't necessarily think barristers are always the best best place to do it. I think you'll hear a variety of views on this. I find um, sometimes, because I'd be like this myself, um, there's a tendency, I think, to want to um, give your legal view about things. And that's not what a mediator is necessarily there to do. So I've used some wonderful mediators that um, I their people skills are, you know, 110 percent and they have really um, facilitated settlement because they understand people and understand what will sort of get get the get the thing over the line. Yeah. Um, I mean, mediation is a is a is a is a long and fascinating topic. and We could talk about it an awfully long time. I think one thing I'd like to pick up on is how, how you prepare and what you what you can expect at a mediation. Um, Cara, you and I have done done it. A lot we've been at many mediations um, and how to summarize what to expect I think from my my perspective what will often happen in a dispute is that the whole morning can be terribly frustrating as each each party is trying to sound out the other and who might make the first offer who, who might not uh, and it's often not till towards the end of the afternoon that you even feel that you're getting anywhere. I wish it were otherwise, but I can't tell you the number of times that I've mediated and they've been successful, but where you haven't actually started doing the drafting the mediation agreement until the middle of the evening. Um, and if your parties are very robust, yeah, they can stay with you till midnight. How about, if you had some late nighters, Cara, do you find that uh, the settlement stuff doesn't really kick in until early evening? Yeah, I've had a lot of late nighters. I find that there's a lot of the morning can be frustratingly spent, like you say, either with the family dispute element being sort of brought out and having to put that to one side, or frustratingly, the estate suddenly changes size. And so we spend a lot of time arguing over valuations and what the estate actually is um, on the actual morning. But once you've got through those things, you're absolutely right. There's a bit of arguing about who's going to go first. Someone does eventually go first, normally starts really right at the top or right at the bottom. And we start sala uh, salami cutting. But that gets us, as you say, to the afternoon before you feel that there's any movement, which can be quite frustrating for those involved in mediation. But then it does start to move quite quickly from that point onwards. And yeah, absolutely. I always find these these types of claims, these types of uh, mediations will always, I think I've had one finish before five o'clock or the rest have always ran on. So they are quite a long day. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd go along with that. Let's go. Uh, I, just reflecting now while Cara was speaking, uh, it makes it sound like mediation is this uh, sort of, you know, triathlon, a sort of hideous endurance process. In some ways it is. That's not to say it's not absolutely worthwhile. I, I, I am a, a firm believer in the um, in the benefits of mediation. It will mean compromise and you do have to spend a lot of time as a legal advisor um, helping parties, whether it's lay people, whether it's charities, um, navigating their way to an acceptance of a, of, of a compromise. Um, you often have a mediator who will say, you know, if nobody's happy at the end of the day, but you've settled, then it's been a victory for everybody. It's not designed to, 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 to make you feel happy, this process. It's designed to, you know, get you to a better place than spending all those tens and tens of thousands of pounds more in, in court. Um, just as a final, I know we're, we're, we're running short of time. Um, Cara and I may, I don't know the answers, we may have very different views about this. So I'm just going to throw this out there. I much prefer uh, having a mediation in person rather than remote. I know colleagues like doing remote mediations. I loathe them. I think um, if everybody's there and investing the time and effort and can't walk away from their computer screen to go and make a cup of tea, I have found that in-person mediations work best. If they have to be done remotely, of course, we're in the modern world. That's good. It's good that they can take place like that. But my experience has been that the in-person mediation 
has a better chance of success. Am I wrong, Cara? What do you think? You know, I actually agree with you. I do think that the modern world is very helpful for the remote mediations because international clients now don't have to fly back to the UK. It can save an awful lot of expense by having the remote mediation, which is great. But I agree, in person, there is no there, there are no distractions. You are in a room with your legal advisor, if that's what you choose to do, and you are there until one or other party decides that they've had enough or you've hopefully settled. And it provides some real great focus and therefore more likelihood of success. Again, in my view, I agree. Great. Cara, we've just got a final bit that you're going to wrap up with. Um, and we yes. don't want to outstay our welcome, so I'll no. You straight away it's just very quickly i mean obviously we would all want mediation uh to be successful um but there's no you know we can't do any guarantees uh if there if there is settlement i think the one thing to very quickly just talk about that we've we've missed off is that actually as a charity don't expect your money the next day don't even expect it within a couple of weeks there might be a property to sell there might be um, administration to complete there might have been a caveat that needs to be removed before the grant can even be obtained so there is going to be a delay between finally getting some sort of settlement and not getting a settlement but then even if uh, so so even if you do succeed please bear in mind there will be a bit of a delay if you don't succeed though then your final preparations for trial you need to run through whether or not you've got enough evidence do you need more evidence are you allowed to submit more evidence or do you need to make an application to the court to get permission to do something um, at this stage you really really need to have counsel on board uh, already but if you haven't definitely you need to be getting counsel on board you need to have your conference you need to be getting them ready for trial um, and you need to be talking to your experts talking to everybody to make sure that you know where you're going to be on the first day of this final hearing, this trial. Um, once you've decided what you need, then you obviously have to get on with doing it. By this point, you're probably going to have a trial date or at least a trial window, which tells you roughly when the trial will take place. That is immovable without the court's permission. So these extra things you might want to do, you've got to fit them in or ask the court very nicely if they will agree and, and don't think that they're all going to agree. The courts are somewhat inundated um, at the minute with delays you're looking at uh, I don't know if Kate's got any more up-to-date information but last time I looked the Chancery Court for a five-day trial uh, which is pretty average for lots of witnesses in a, in a dispute like this with a bit of reading time the it, it, they're listing them for October next year so you have got a big delay on actually getting to that point you want your listing appointment to be as early as possible so you at least can get your hearing listed even if you haven't done the bits in the middle um, but that, that's essentially what you need to do, the things you need to be thinking about. Um, that, that's, I suppose that's it, that what's going to happen next month on the next one of these, which neither I or Kate will be at, but someone else from IDR and Radcliffe will be. Uh, I think it's Eleanor Stenson from my end. Um, I'm not actually, it's terrible. I should know who's presenting from your end, Kate. Um, it might be Tom. It might be Tom Dumont. And I know one of my colleagues, Sophia, is also um, uh, doing one of these. So you'll, you'll have I great pleasure listening to, uh, yes. listen to either or both of them. I think I was actually, as you said that, I think it is definitely Tom that's doing the next one. So Tom and Eleanor will be at the next one next month. So register if you haven't already. And they are going to go through that final trial, what that's like, what you can expect to happen, what that might do to help feed into what we've talked about today as to what decisions you might need to make. Um, and all of that so that uh, that's looking to be great so do sign up I've seen we do have a bit of a chat function but I'm conscious of the time so if anybody has a sort of a, a question they want to put out please do email us and we'll put a group together of the questions and come back to you the only question I've seen on there is would the court ever appoint a joint expert one both sides agree on absolutely just to answer that question question very quickly yes if the parties agree to a joint expert you can use the same expert uh, and then you put questions to the expert afterwards if, you know, depending on what side you're on and what information they've given you to just clarify how they've come to that decision. It can be quite a good way of narrowing the length of time a trial might take because you've got less witnesses, uh, less experts, uh, and also might help the mediation or ADR process because you've got uh, something that someone that, you, that both parties have agreed on giving evidence to say, I agree with you or I don't. Um, so that can actually be very helpful, a joint expert. So thank you for that question. Um, but as Kate said, very conscious that we might have overstayed our welcome. So apologies for the delay at the start. Uh, and we'll let you all get on with your day. But thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.